Great, and now we are recording and we are live. We'll wait for that number to stabilize and then get started. Okay, um, we're re ready to start, Paula. Can I uh, jump in with the introduction? Wonderful. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This is a special occasion today, not only because it's our final uh, bioengineering seminar for the semester, but it's also our distinguished lecturer, uh, the highlight of the seminar series. And this year, we are very, very fortunate to be joined by Professor Paula Hammond from MIT. So Professor Hammond is the David Cook Chair Professor uh, at MIT in Engineering. She's also the Department Chair of Chemical Engineering at MIT. So a bit of background on her. Uh, she did her undergraduate work uh, at MIT uh, and then worked in industry uh, for a time at Motorola uh, and then came back to graduate school, first for a master's degree at Georgia Tech and then back to MIT for her doctoral work. Uh, after a short postdoc at Harvard, uh, ended up joining the faculty at MIT shortly after her degree, where she's been ever since, has risen through the ranks, and as I mentioned, is now the department chair. So if I was to spend, uh, 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 if I was to start reciting all of the awards uh, that she's won, uh, we really would take up the whole hour. It's an incredibly impressive uh, CV. So I'll just uh, name a few of the highlights. Uh, she's received awards and a number of named lecturers from a variety of professional societies, including AICHE, ACS, uh, and uh, MRS. Uh, and probably the most uh, a sort of um, a prestigious set of awards that she's won is that she's one of an, an extremely small number of people, like less than 30, I believe, uh, who have been elected to all three national academies, the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, so, you know, incredibly impressive, the elite of the elite. Uh, in the course of uh, amassing all of these accomplishments, she's published uh, over 300 papers, uh, has 20 patents, uh, and has been incredibly active on the translational side as well. Uh, and among the uh, many uh, connections that she has to biotechnology industry, she's on the uh, scientific advisory board for a small company that you may have heard of and may even have some personal experience with called Moderna Therapeutics. Uh, so it really goes without saying that she's an incredibly decorated and accomplished uh, scientist, engineer, academic leader. But on a more personal note, I've had the opportunity to have probably half a dozen or so conversations uh, with her over the years. And she's one of those people that when you talk to her, you not only uh, come away from the conversation feeling like you've learned something and are, are smarter as a result of the interaction, but you also feel better uh, about yourself and what you're doing and the mission that we all have uh, in academia. And I think that's really exemplified uh, by a section on our website called Our Values, which I had a chance to review uh, before putting this introduction together. And it's probably one of the best, most comprehensive and thoughtful uh, value statements that I've seen anywhere on any uh, website. And I think it surely reflects her incredible skill and care uh, as, uh, as a mentor, as well as uh, a scientist and all the other various hats that she wears. So uh, we sort of took a formal photo of this earlier. Uh, uh, Paula, if you wouldn't mind sort of uh, showing uh, the plaque if you, you have it handy. Uh, this is uh, something that we, tradition we have for all of our distinguished lecturers. Uh, that's, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, we were able to get it to her before the, uh, the seminar uh, started. We got a nice photo of this earlier, so I think we're, we're okay. But uh, in any case, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Hammond for uh, spending time with us today, taking time from your busy schedule. Uh, we're absolutely looking forward to your presentation. And for those of you in the audience, if you have questions over the course of the, uh, the hour, uh, please put, put them in the, uh, the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to get them at the very end. So uh, Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sanjay. That was such a wonderful introduction and I really feel welcome here. And uh, I appreciate the chance to talk to all of you. And what I'm going to do is share screen 
and uh, tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing in my lab using polyelectrolyte multilayer assembly, also known as layer by layer. And uh, I'm going to focus on uh, systems that are smaller than the ones shown on this page, where um, we have been using these approaches for uh, essentially guiding the regeneration of bone around biomedical implants and uh, regenerating uh, tissue in wounds. Uh, but we've also been looking at how we can apply these to nanoparticles. So I'm going to uh, focus a little bit more on that work. Now, layer by layer assembly itself is a very simple process in which a charged multivalent material system is absorbed onto an oppositely charged substrate. Uh, that absorption takes place from an aqueous solution. The absorption continues until ultimately the surface charge is reversed. And at that point, you usually get just uh, a nanometer to, or two, or maybe two, a few tens of nanometers thick layer of that material, which is typically for us a polyelectrolyte brush layer. And by this point, we have reversed the surface charge and no further deposition takes place. You can then rinse the substrate and immerse it into another dilute aqueous solution. And again, uh, you drive absorption of the oppositely charged polymer material, which ultimately is stopped by electrostatic repulsion when you get surface charge reversal. So you continue to build up these very consistent uh, thin films layer by layer, and you can actually construct a material system in our case, we've been very interested in using this water-based assembly method to assemble a number of biomolecules, including nucleic acids and proteins, into our thin films and alternating them with a degradable polymer that then allows us to deliver drugs from surfaces. When we began to look at how we could use this technology for cancer therapies, we were really interested in addressing highly aggressive forms of cancer, uh, the ones that are typically resistant to traditional treatments. And one way of doing this is to create a combination system. For example, we can take a nanoparticle core that we're already familiar with, like a liposome or perhaps a uh, PLGA or polylactic glycolic acid nanoparticle that will degrade or break down. And we can incorporate our drug, be it hydrophobic or hydrophilic, based on that information into our nanoparticle. At that point, uh, we can essentially adsorb onto the surface of the nanoparticle an oppositely charged polymer. So if we make our liposome negatively charged, we can then adsorb a polycation onto the surface of that nanoparticle. Um, we can then adsorb a negatively charged species. And in our case, the idea is that we can uh, use a, uh, a nucleic acid that can regulate the tumor cells that we're targeting. Finally, we can put down another positively charged layer and we have protected that nucleic acid and created a combination system. However, a positively charged nanoparticle when it's introduced systemically will rapidly absorb plasma proteins which are negatively charged. And that will rapidly cause uh, the, these nanoparticles to be taken up by the monocytes uh, that are going to clear the bloodstream and uh, essentially we'll get rapid elimination of these systems uh, instead of giving them the time that they need to circulate and accumulate in the tumor. So we need a final outer layer and that outer layer is negatively charged. And typically uh, we want something that is going to be a native polyelectrolyte like a polysaccharide or polypeptide that has large amounts of water of hydration and uh, will therefore give us enthalpic reasons why we don't want adsorption on this surface, as well as the steric reasons that we get from the polymer brush itself. So this gives us a nice stabilizing outer layer that uh, essentially is our stealth or cloaking layer. The final result is the end up of a combination that essentially uh, provides a nucleic acid like siRNA that will essentially silence some of these tumor defense mechanisms or genetic modifications that enable tumor cells to survive in the presence of chemo drug, followed by chemotherapy drug. And we have this outer layer, which we can use for stealth, but we've also found we can use the same layer for targeting. Uh, what these look like when we make them, we essentially uh, can extrude liposomes so that they're roughly the same size. So we get somewhere between 80 to 90, 90 to maybe 100 nanometer sized liposomes. These are uh, great for encapsulating cisplatin, doxorubicin, 
in a range of water-soluble drugs, as well as uh, incorporating um, uh, some of the amphiphilic drugs that may be interesting. And ultimately, we can coat these with a layer-by-layer -layer film. We can also coat PLGA, which is great for incorporating hydrophobic drugs. And a number of inhibitors that we've worked with have been very hydrophobic. We will then move to this hydrophobic drug platform. So there are a lot of advantages, as it turns out, to using a layer-by-layer -layer approach. I described this combination approach for incorporating siRNA. But even if we just put down a positively charged layer and then that outer layer for stealth, we end up with some interesting characteristics. For example, here we built a bilayer by absorbing onto uh, a nanoparticle first poly L uh, lysine, which has got a primary amine, and then hyaluronic acid, which has these carboxylic acids. And this leads to a bilayer blend of sorts of these primary amine and carboxylic acid groups with an excess of acid on the outer rim. Uh, that then gives us something that at pH 7.4 has a negative zeta potential around minus 30 millivolts or so, and uh, is, is fairly uh, well um, contained. We have maybe about a, uh, a, an 18 to 20 nanometer kind of radius around uh, thickness around the nanoparticle. However, if we begin to shift the charge, uh, if we essentially titrate uh, the aqueous solution so that we go down to lower pHs, we're also titrating these carboxylic acids. And that erases some of the negative charge and we lose some of those electrostatic crosslinks and we get swelling. And this is something that we can use, for example, to enhance release of contents within the layers of our film, as well as to change the layer by layer barrier to diffusion of things in the core. Um, we also can use this as a way to change the net charge of this nanoparticle, which is now becoming less and less negative and in some cases, we've seen a shift all the way to positive charge. In those cases, we can actually uh, create a nanoparticle that in a more acidic environment, like the hypoxic environment around pH 6.8 to 7, uh, that we see in a number of tumors because they're not effective at getting oxygen to the tumor. In this case, a nanoparticle that is very strongly negatively charged uh, is uh, very, very non-interactive with cells. And, in the bloodstream, uh, when they are able to enter the tumor, if they experience a high, an hypoxic environment, will become a sticky nanoparticle, one that exhibits little charge or perhaps slight positive charge, um, is slightly swollen and is taken up very rapidly um, by uh, tumor cells. So this is just one trick in which we can use this polyelectrolyte bilayer to essentially shift from the stealth mode to the sticky mode when we really want these nanoparticles to be taken up in large amounts by the tumors surrounding them. However, we also would like to have more specific interactions to guide uptake of these nanoparticles. And nanomedicine has really um, gone the way of using targeting ligands of various sorts that can recognize specific proteins that are present in our, on the surfaces of cancer cells. In our case, we found that hyaluronic acid itself, uh, which is already known to be a very strong ligand for CD44. Uh, in fact, CD44 is highly overexpressed on a number of solid cancer cell surfaces. So for us, hyaluronic acid, which was already sort of the dream stealth layer because of its huge amount of hydration and strong negative charge, also is a targeting vehicle for a number of solid epithelial cancers, which highly overexpress CD44. This is an example of triple negative breast cancers uh, cells, for example, uh, where we have labeled with red uh, fluorescence, uh, the nanoparticles that are clearly in the cytoplasm taken up in large amounts. And uh, we can titrate that away if we introduce excess hyaluronic acid. Uh, when we look at uptake based on CD44, here, we're looking at uh, a simple um, uh, tumor section after tail vein injection, waiting 48 hours. And we can see that our nanoparticles, now labeled green in this section, are accumulating in the regions where we have tumor cells, which are labeled with CD44 in red, and that there's a huge overlap of the nanoparticles with the tumor cells. The stromal cells around the tumor 
are not uh, taking up or accumulating these nanoparticles, but we do see that nanoparticles are able to transport across the stromal layer to get to the tumor. So um, how do these systems work when we try to apply them in animal models? Uh, we did look at several examples, including triple negative breast cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, in the case of non-small cell lung cancer, we used an orthotopic model that was derived from an octothenous mouse model developed by the Tyler Jacks lab. This model was based on two very frequent mutations that take place in non-small cell lung cancer, especially for uh, the more aggressive and drug resistant types. Uh, this includes KRAS, which is a, an oncogene that is known to be difficult to design small molecules uh, for inhibition. Uh, we can use siRNA very effectively for KRAS. It's an oncogene that really uh, enables tumor cells to proliferate and undergo a metastatic behavior over time. And it also helps with escape uh, in the presence of chemotherapy drugs such as DNA damaging drugs. And the other is P53. P53 is actually um, a guardian gene. It functions by regulating the amount of DNA damage that takes place in these cancer cells and uh, essentially allowing these cells to undergo a programmed cell death if there's excess too much DNA damage that takes place. And without P53 functioning, um, we actually see cancer cells uh, thrive and even in the presence of DNA damaging agents. So uh, we want to replace P53 function with a microRNA known as MIR34A, which is also a, a 22 to 23 base pair construct, much like the siRNA that we're using. Because these are really just two negatively charged uh, molecules, we can absorb them together in our layer by layer construct. So here we start with a liposome that contains within it cisplatin, which is the DNA damaging drug. Uh, we then absorb polyalarginine, uh, our KRAS, siRNA, and MIR34. Um, uh, they both go in together in this blue layer, polyalarginine again, and then hyaluronic acid. When we look at in vitro release, we can see that siRNA is going to come out more rapidly from the outer layer, and cisplatin is coming out at a rate that's about three times slower, which gives us time to essentially reprogram tumor cells that have taken up the nanoparticle, and uh, then release the cisplatin in significant amounts that will allow us to kill tumor cells. Uh, so we actually looked at how these performed in, uh, in this mouse model uh, the, uh, that was really derived from the Tyler Jacks lab. Uh, and uh, the first thing we did was look at targeting to uh, lung cancer in these mice. Here we're looking at healthy mice on the left and you can see the fluorescence uh, over time up to 48 hours. The mouse really lights up. We tend to have a nice half-life for these nanoparticles that's about 28 uh, hours. And uh, when we look at the accumulation, it's mostly in the liver, but not in the lungs. However, when we have the mice, which have this orthotopic uh, lung cancer uh, in the present, these nodules throughout the lung, we can see that there's a large accumulation in the lungs, about 40 to 50 fold higher. And uh, when we look at why, we can see through staining that CD44 is highly present in this mouse model. So now if we take the nanoparticle and incorporate our cisplatin and our targeted RNA and microRNA molecules, uh, we can look at uh, what happens. And in our case, we see that uh, the control, this is a very rapidly growing cancer. It's fairly aggressive. Um, and uh, we see that the tumor size decreases a little bit when we just have RNA. When we have just cisplatin, we do much better. Uh, the combination, we're not seeing the same kind of tumor volume. And uh, we see that survival is also enhanced. So here we can see roughly a 30% enhancement in survivability over the cisplatin in the targeted therapy alone. So we're excited about these kinds of results. And uh, the idea then was, how can we extrapolate this, uh, this kind of result and make it work? Um, so what we started to look at was in ovarian cancer, where there's a real need for development of therapies, how we might be able to 
find a range of different outer surface layers that may be able to give us high affinity for ovarian cancer cells. So we made libraries. This one is a small library of carboxylated surfaces and sulfated surfaces based on these naturally occurring and homopolypeptide, synthetic homo homopolypeptide systems. And there's our, uh, our hyaluronic acid included in that. We then assayed against a, a large range of ovarian cancer cells. And uh, we looked at non-cancerous cell lines as well because we were really looking for what outer layer would give us specificity as well as a high affinity for ovarian cancer. And uh, after using cell sorting uh, and measuring uh, systematically the differences in uh, the fluorescence in these cells, we found that there were a few interesting contenders uh, that gave us high affinity for ovarian cancer cells specifically. And these included hyaluronic acid, which made a great deal of sense to us given the CD44 binding, but also two other players, polyalglutamic acid and polyl aspartic acid, which were not uh, ones that we could understand a specific binding partner for. When we looked more closely at what was happening in these systems, we used uh, uh, labeling and confocal microscopy to examine where um, the hyaluronic acid goes first. And we can see that that internalizes as expected. It's an uh, endosomal uptake, which ultimately leads to an escape. Whereas in the surface bound systems, uh, we find that particles bind to cell membranes on the outside. And uh, that leads to um, essentially no movement of these nanoparticles over time. In the meantime, uh, for poly L aspartic acid, we get something that's somewhere in between. Even though there's just one methylene difference in the side group of this polymer versus the other polymer, um, we see that rather than just sticking to the outer membrane, it actually has sort of this in-between behavior where it slowly comes in. We found that the internalization in a uh, hyaluronic acid, which is clathrin mediated, is quite different from uh, the caviolin mediated uh, uptake that we saw with polyl aspartic acid. We decided to take advantage of these differences. Polyl glutamic acid was interesting to us because the nanoparticle sits on the outside of that membrane of the ovarian cancer cell and just stays there. And uh, for us, this was uh, interesting and we're still trying to understand whether these are nonspecific uh, but very strong interactions. Um, we can't identify any specific protein receptor interaction. And uh, we're beginning to work with uh, systems biologists to understand that further. But in the meantime, we thought this is actually an opportunity because uh, if we want to deliver something like a protein or uh, another sensitive molecule, that would degrade in the endosome and that we would rather present to other cell surface membrane receptors uh, in neighboring cells, then polyglutamic acid would provide that method because we could encapsulate that protein. It would sit on the outside of the membrane and release to neighboring cells rather than taking it inside and degrading it. So uh, we began to work with uh, Daryl Irvin, my colleague who's uh, just two floors down on uh, immunotherapy using a very different approach. Uh, ovarian cancer is known to be what's uh, often called a cold tumor environment. Uh, there are very small numbers of infiltrated leukocytes uh, that are present in the very uh, aggressive forms of ovarian cancer. And uh, for that reason, even some of the checkpoint inhibitors that have been so successful in certain other kinds of cancers are fairly non-active because there aren't, there's not really any action to regulate or, or modify. However, if we can upregulate the immune response in these tumors, then we can actually get an immune response going. And that may allow us to begin to see uh, the kind of immune attack that we want on tumor cells in that environment. So self is a cytokine. It is one of these uh, proteins that typically we would want uh, to interact with other cell surface membrane receptors. And the reason for that is it's typically 
generated by activated antigen presenting cells. Uh, and it leads to uh, essentially through signaling with other receptors on other uh, immune cell types, the generation of interferon gamma, which is of course one of the uh, most important uh, immune stimulators and uh, enhances both T and NK cell activity. So the idea is that we could use this cytokine to essentially create a kind of cytokine storm within the tumor, which draws more leukocytes to the site, uh, causes some tumor cell death as well due to inflammatory response and produces antigens, antigen presenting cells and a more directed and targeted immune response from that initial innate immune response. However, IL-12 is a very effective uh, cytokine and for that reason, it's potent. Um, if it's delivered systemically, there's the danger of activating that cytokine storm of sorts in the bloodstream and getting a systemic response. And that leads to failure and uh, leads to great harm to the patient. So um, in this case, we thought we could actually use our LBL approach to encapsulate IL-12 and then deliver it from the surfaces of ovarian cancer cells. So here's our IL-12 nanoparticle design. Uh, here we take a liposome, which is uh, presenting a negative charge. And we have certain points here where we have essentially a means of linking uh, the uh, cytokine. And in our case, uh, we use this nickel his uh, uh, connection, which gave us a very simple way of attaching uh, our cytokine. Now we're using other modes such as uh, covalent bonding and uh, we're examining the differences that we get. We can actually layer on top of this uh, cytokine containing liposome, uh, a polyallarginine. And now we have a coat covering the cytokine and then our polyanion, which in our case, uh, we focused on polyglutamic acid, although we did do comparisons with hyaluronic acid. So it's worth mentioning that because we've covered this up with a bilayer, we have to understand how the cytokine is going to get out. And uh, we actually used FRET labeling of the different components to determine when they get released from the surface. And here, what you see is essentially the release curve where we go uh, from 100% down uh, for both the poly -L arginine which more rapidly uh, decreases in intensity, showing that it is coming off first, followed by the IL-12, which follows. So we do believe that we get a kind of uh, deconstruction of the layer by layer film when it is sitting in the tumor compartment over time. Uh, again, there's a slight shift in the pH and the conditions within the tumor that allow um, these charged groups to be titrated and slowly we begin to deconstruct or destabilize that film. And we get shedding of the layers. And ultimately the cytokine itself is freed uh, from the uh, nickel his surface. So I mentioned that ovarian cancer is particularly challenging. We did our initial studies on uh, uh, colon cancer models and then looked to see whether or not we could uh, initiate an immune response with ovarian cancer we chose an HM1 model, which is a syngeneic mouse model um, that is fully immune competent. And uh, we looked at first whether we could eliminate that toxicity in these mice. So here we're looking at uh, a fairly decent dose of IL-12, 10 micrograms, introduced intraperitoneally. So this is an intraperitoneal uh, injection. So we're getting right to that abdominal area. And uh, here we can see that IL-12 delivered directly is giving us a very significant amount of uh, weight loss of the animals. And these arrows are indicating where we got tox-related deaths. However, in our package nanoparticle, we can see that we don't see these deaths and that we're able to maintain uh, the weight of the animal. So along with tox, we want to look at efficacy. And here we're looking at the survival of uh, the mice. Um, this is an orthotopic uh, HM1 syngenetic model. So these tumors are growing rapidly. And what we see is uh, that the control, uh, there's a significant amount 
of uh, loss of animals at uh, just uh, 20 days or so. When we introduce IL-12 free, um, we see that some animals are dying right away here, um, just from the presence of that high amount of cytokine in the uh, system, it becomes systemic rapidly. However, in our packaged nanoparticle, we did find that we didn't get that significant loss due to uh, toxicity. And we also were able to preserve uh, the survivability of these animals out to much longer time periods. And ultimately we had some that went through a, a complete uh, cure. Um, when we look at uh, the PLE nanoparticles and where they're going, I mentioned that we did our studies using IP, uh, but we also do intravenous studies because we think both approaches are very relevant. IV, more along the lines of uh, the most common and traditional way of treating patients today uh, and the most accessible. IP because we can get more directly to the regions where these uh, uh, tumors uh, live and also where they metastasize, which tends to be within the abdominal cavity. And we found that IP was much more effective for nanoparticle accumulation, uh, which is not unexpected. We had done an earlier um, paper just looking at hyaluronic acid targeting the uh, ovarian cancer surfaces. And we found that we can get something like 90 to 95% of the um, fluorescence from our nanoparticle picked up in IP cavity versus uh, in the, the rest of the body. So we can get a lot of targeting and the targeting is in the tumor regions. IV is not perfect, but it's not bad. We get something that would be the equivalent of a, say a five to 6% injected dose. Uh, and in some cases we've seen as high as 10 to 13% injected dose with these systems. And when we compare that to the nanoparticles that don't have the layer by layer outer coating, we see that that is very small in comparison, that we don't get the same kind of targeting. And we can see this again, this is some of the same data uh, quantitative over time where we're looking at four and 24 hour IV and IP delivery. And again, clearly IP is winning in terms of uh, trying to get to the cancer that we want. We wanted to make sure that uh, we were getting the kinds of responses that uh, we wanted based on the immune response. So here you can see uh, the, in this IL-12 therapy where we're looking at a somewhat smaller dose of five micrograms, we're looking at whether or not we're producing CD8 positive T cells in the tumor. Uh, and uh, we can compare that to free IL-12 and we see that we are getting the equivalent sort of numbers roughly in our nanoparticle and in the soluble IL-12 formulations as we can see from facts. And of course, we want this activation to be tumor specific. We don't want to activate the immune system in other parts of the body, uh, particularly in that IP cavity. So here we're looking at tumors and uh, we can look at both the NKT cells, NK cells and CD8 cells. And what you're seeing are the uh, sort of uh, control and unlayered nanoparticle animals and IL-12 in its free mode versus our red nanoparticles. And we see that the nanoparticles do give us an enhancement in uh, NKT and NK cells. And we see that they give a, a decent presence of the CD8 positive cells as well. However, just looking in the ascites, we see that that differential is, is lost and uh, that we get about the same as we do with the dextrose and uh, the same with the spleen. So we are seeing that targeting really is for the solid tumor. And uh, another thing that is relevant is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, checkpoint inhibitors aren't very effective in ovarian cancer. However, when we upregulate the innate immune response, and ultimately we get that adaptive immune response going, uh, we also present the opportunity for regulatory cells to begin to play a role again in trying to mediate uh, that tumor immune response. And so we looked for whether or not PDL1 was being expressed in our treated tumors. And what we found particularly interesting here 
uh, was that we found an uptick in pdl one presence, particularly in our nanoparticle formulation versus the free IL-12. And uh, this is something that we're still trying to understand, but it may have to do with both the rates of release uh, between free IL-12 and uh, the nanoparticle and the residence time in the tumor. It may also have to do with the packaging of the IL-12 in these uh, polycationic layers, which may have some sort of adjuvanting effect. Uh, but in any case, the presence of PDL1 is promising in the sense that now those checkpoint inhibitors in combination with this treatment can become even more interesting. And uh, we do not see this uptick in PDL1 in other organs like the spleen. We also wanted to make sure that uh, we were being more general about this approach. And, and the HM1 model is an approach in which we have uh, moderate T cell presence, a lot of granulocyte infiltration, and it's relatively responsive to DNA damaging agents, but it doesn't really respond to PD1 or L1. We looked at another tumor model that was syngeneic, KPCA, uh, which is one out of the uh, Bob Weinberg lab at the Whitehead Institute. This one is a mostly cold tumor. It has moderate amounts of granulocytes and it has a large number of these Tregs, which are going to suppress the immune response. And what we found when we compared the HM1 model, and here's the data that I presented earlier for HM1 with KPCA, that KPCA is even more responsive to the IL-12 nanoparticles, that uh, the presence of the cytokine is able to deliver an even stronger immune response in these tumors than we were seeing in the HM1. So it may be that there will be specific biomarkers that indicate the promise for this kind of treatment with ovarian cancer patients. We're beginning to look now at combinations with a number of different inhibitors to see their impact. So this, you know, I don't mean for you to have to look at all of these curves, but this just shows the range of different responses and survivability with these different inhibitors that we can see. So the future of this work is uh, to try and understand how we can effectively tune this release rate so that it is responsive to the tumor microenvironment. Um, we think that now we have a, an effective carrier, uh, but we want to ensure that very little of the cytokine gets out in the bloodstream or, uh, and, and we want to improve that IV delivery. And we also would like to um, essentially control the rates at which this gets released and uh, use that in our combination therapies to release a range of different uh, cytokines such as IL-18 and IL-2. So that's kind of the direction of that work. Very briefly, I'll touch on some other things that we're doing with the nanoparticle platform. We have been working with the Broad Institute on a platform that they call PRISM. Here's a, a description of, of the origin of that acronym, which is really meant for drug discovery. But they have this beautiful uh, and large library of DNA barcoded cancer cells. And we're looking at essentially what nanoparticles interact with those uh, specific cancer cells and trying to understand uh, whether or not they get taken up by those cells and why. Here is a kind of uh, depiction of the PRISM process in which uh, they have these stably DNA barcoded cell lines that represent a very broad range of cancer types. And each one of them has its own unique DNA barcode. Uh, we then look at this large array in which we know sort of the genetic profile of each of the cells we're working with, and we assay our nanoparticles with them. And uh, here you look at the different kinds of cancers that we can explore. Um, uh, it is also possible to, possible to explore some healthy cells in this approach. We have been looking at uh, what causes uptake with nanoparticles more generally, as well as using this tool to understand specific interactions with our layer by layer nanoparticles. Some of our more recent work uh, on this has just been uh, published in BioArchive. We're hoping to, we've submitted it now, so we're hoping to publish it in a journal soon. In this work, we found that there are some specific genes that may be responsible for high degrees of uptake 
of nanoparticles by cancer cells. And when those are present, we may be able to use them as a biomarker for patients who will respond well to nanoparticles. Uh, finally, we've been looking at the role of nanoparticle carrier elasticity on the trafficking of these uh, nanomaterials. Uh, elasticity is a property that has been of interest for nanoparticles. A number of great groups have been studying this. These are two examples on the left, for example, uh, Xiaoyu Zhang, uh, looking at these soft zwitterionic nanogels found that you get longer circulation times and lower splenic accumulation. This is thought to be because they can actually squeeze in between uh, some of the junctions between cells uh, or gaps or defects in a way that allows them to survive longer in the bloodstream. Um, there is also this great work by Deborah Auguste and Marsha Moses, which examined uh, uh, liposomal elasticity and how that directs tumor uptake and work by Samir Mitragoltri and Matt Hel Helgeson uh, on elasticity of nanoparticles and their impact on phago and endocytosis. And we're excited about all of this because it enables another parameter, another knob that can be turned to adjust our nanoparticles for greater targeting and greater delivery efficiency. So the question was, what does our layer by layer nanoparticle outer layer do to this rigidity effect? Does it mask the properties of the core, be it rigid or soft? Will we still see these effects? And can we combine this with our targeting chemistry? So my student, uh, Stephanie Kahn, uh, essentially looked at uh, rigid la layer by layer nanoparticles where, where rigid means using a lipid uh, that when it assembles gives us a nice, very highly crystalline structure. So here you can see this unsaturated uh, uh, backbones of these uh, lipids and uh, comparing them to ones in which we add a little bit of cholesterol, which breaks up that ordering. And now we have something that is, uh, has a lower modulus and is essentially more pliable. Um, these are all the same size. So here she's showing uh, using cold green and purple, the rigid and soft, and they tend to be the same size after you put down the first and the second layer. And we can see the nice alternation in charge. When we image them using cryo EM, uh, we do see that the rigid nanoparticle does give us that faceted kind of crystalline look. Uh, whereas the one with cholesterol is giving us this uh, more perfect sphere appearance. And uh, this is uh, very uh, sort of consistent with what's been observed in general. And uh, here uh, we're just showing our system with the cholesterol and without the cholesterol. And these are observations taken um, at and below uh, body temperature. So then the question was, does this change the elimination and plasma half-life? Here we're looking at elimination half-life and we see that there is a difference between the rigid and the soft, which is sustained over time. And uh, this is consistent with what literature had reported. So we were encouraged by that. Uh, we also saw uh, when we looked at accumulation that there are some differences in accumulation, but for us, we found that the filtration organs tended to have a bit more of the softer uh, nanoparticle rather than less. And uh, we're not sure if this is related to the size range that we're looking at, but it seemed to be fairly consistent. When we look at accumulation in the tumor, we did see some uh, meaningful differences. Here we're using the Psi-7 uh, signal for the nanoparticle and the tumor is, is naturally bioluminescent. So here you can see the bioluminescence of the tumor. And uh, when we have the more rigid system, we get some co-localization, but it's just a little bit less effective. We can measure that tumor radiant efficiency here compared to the soft nanoparticle uh, where we can see that there is more of this uh, tumor radiant efficiency across the board shown here. And of course the average tumor radiance, and we're looking at uh, four of these tumors for each system in this example, um, but yes, the average is uh, the same for the uh, luminescence of these tumors. It may be a little bit hard to see on this screen, but 
hopefully you can see a little bit of this, that when we do cross sections of the tumor on the left, we can see that there's much less tumor accumulated than on the right, where we can see this soft red glow goes all the way through the tumor, indicating that there is a much greater amount of tumor penetration. In fact, if we look at the integrated intensity here of that luminescence that was sort of hard to see on the previous slide, you can see the soft LBL nanoparticle has a significant increase or an enhancement of that uh, fluorescence from the uh, nanoparticle. And we can see this sort of uh, across the board with these different mice with the bars being much higher for the soft LBL nanoparticle versus the rigid, whether we're using the IVIS signal or histological staining. So we essentially use three different methods to try and determine differences in this uh, accumulation of nanoparticle in the tumor, all of which suggest that the softer nanoparticle is better at it. So this is really early uh, data where we're now looking at uh, what we can understand about the system. We're uh, trying to make some mechanical measurements of the nanoparticles we're working with. And we're looking at ways in which we can extend the, the range of properties of the nanoparticles that we layer. Um, the nice thing about layer by layer is it's very adaptive. So we have a number of options along those lines. So these nanoparticles are ones that we're excited about more generally. This is a platform approach, which may be effective in addressing other kinds of tough cancers or including brain uh, glioblastoma and other uh, brain disorders or targeting something like infection. Uh, that uh, tendency to accumulate uh, in inflamed areas or hypoxic areas is something that could be used, for example, to target inflamed lung. Um, this is just an example of work that we had started to do on glioblastoma. We're now looking at using the layer by layer nanoparticles to give us better uh, effective targeting of cancer cells over uh, healthy brain cells in these treatments, as well as getting across the blood brain barrier. And we are interested in the potential for delivering vaccines. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sanjay if, if how much time we have, or if this is where I should stop, perhaps. Well, we're at about uh, five minutes to the top of the hour, Paula, so uh, it's up to you. If you'd like to take questions, uh, this might be a good place to stop, or if you wanted to continue sharing, it's up to you. What I'll do is I'll show my acknowledgement slide, because there's one other story that uh, I will skip over because it's uh, slightly different, but it, it involves treating osteoarthritis. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just acknowledge, let me share screen again. I'd just like to acknowledge the members of lab who contributed to this work, whose names are shown in bold here. And uh, I didn't get to talk about the osteoarthritis work, which is really uh, using charge to penetrate cartilage and deliver a growth factor. Uh, but that was work done uh, by this group here. And I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, the NIH, and the DLD for funding this work and my collaborators. Uh, so thanks to Lee and Santi, Natalie, Tony, Stephanie and Sean, and to uh, Daryl. And uh, I welcome any questions that you have. Fantastic, thank you very much for an incredible seminar as always. So we're very close to the top of the hour and uh, we have a meeting uh, with Professor Hammond and, and a number of our students right after. So we don't want to eat into that time too much, but uh, I see that there are some questions in the Q&A. So maybe I can just pick one and uh, we can go from there. So uh, maybe last in, first out, uh, <laughs> question from Claire Hilberger. Uh, did you try a gradient of cholesterol amounts to determine if this is a linear phenomenon? And I assume this means the mechanics dependence of the performance of the nanoparticles? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I believe Steph did try a few different cholesterol um, formulations, but because we're working at, uh, or looking at this kind of uh, phase transition, basically what she was doing was pushing this over a phase transition. I think she, it, she only had sort of this soft and rigid because of that sort of uh, above and below the uh, melt point property. I think that what we would do if we wanted a range of moduli um, and we were all sort of above uh, the uh, TM of the lipid is we use different lipid types and uh, we might try to crosslink the lipids a little bit. Terrific. 
Uh, maybe we could do one more. Uh, so this is from uh, Grigory uh, Tikomarov. How uniform are the particles prepared by LBL in size, shape, and composition? If they are polydispersed, do you separate them in any way for animal studies? Great question. We um, What determines the uh, uniformity of the LBL particles is the uniformity of the starting batch of core particles. So uh, for liposomes, we extrude them. Um, we have this uh, high pressure temperature uh, modulated extruder so that the, they're actually coming out um, over a range of, uh, uh, I would say the PDIs are out about 1.1, it's, it's somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 or 0.1 or 0.2, depending on how you like to describe dispersity. Uh, and uh, with the layer by layer film, the dispersity really doesn't change very much. Great. Okay, well, I think we're right at uh, one o'clock or four o'clock in Cambridge. So maybe we can stop there and uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Hammond once again for an incredible presentation. Uh, really can't think of a better way to, uh, to end our seminar series for the spring. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was great talking with all of you. Wonderful, thank you. So um, Paula, I think if you just hold on the line, we can transition you directly to the next meeting. Okay. Everyone else have a great afternoon. Yes, any graduate students who want to meet with uh, Professor Hammond, just stay on. <laughs> While we're waiting, I'm just going to take a look at, for some reason, there are several notifications that happened while I was talking. So I'm just gonna mute for Great, Kwasi, so you're going to serve as host? Actually, I'll just be staying on until um, the end of the discussion, and then I'll end it then. OK, thanks, Alana. But I'm just signing everybody over to panelists so they can share their video. So Kwasi, I just got an email from a graduate student in IB who was interested in joining this one o'clock meeting. So I'm just going to go ahead and email you his email or her email uh, and uh, let you decide whether to, to send the coordinates or not. Okay, well, sounds good. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm on. I'm on. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, wonderful. There. I know, yeah, I, I didn't know. If, I, I didn't know if you just. Um, I, I thought I'd get kicked out and then ha would have to like c come back in, but th thank you. Thanks. Great. All good. Okay. Well, uh, looks like they're in good hands. Thanks, Alana. Yeah. And thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. Thank you, John. Thanks, uh, Sanjay. It was good to see you again, too. Uh, likewise, yeah, yeah, wonderful. So, uh, best wishes and uh, hope to hope to see you in person sometime soon. But uh, Hope to catch up again in any case. Thanks a lot. Take care. Need to take care.